My name is Bo Sun, and I'm from HRL Laboratories, and I'm here to talk about full permutation dynamical decoupling in an encoded triple dot qubit. So dynamical decoupling uh, can preserve coherence in quantum systems by using carefully timed uh, block sphere rotations. And in silicon, um, it's been demonstrated that dynamical decoupling can preserve uh, spin coherence in an ensemble of donor bound spins for greater than one second or uh, in a single quantum dot for greater than 20 milliseconds. However, more than just preserving coherence, dynamical decoupling can also be used to characterize noise sources. And this is because it echoes out low frequency noise and renders you more sensitive to high frequency noise spectra where experiments such as um, time Robbie oscillations or T2 star uh, are simply too broadband to access. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce the sequence that we call full permutation dynamical decoupling. And this is a specific construction of a more general sequence where we're going to demonstrate that this sequence has a coherence time of more than 700 microseconds of wall clock time. And it has error rates less than 5e minus 5 per pulse, meaning that we can preserve qubit coherence for more than 17,000 exchange pulses. And this gives us an opportunity here to answer the question, do we really understand the physics that leads to these performance numbers? So now that I've spoiled this talk a little bit, let's go backwards and talk about the system that we're measuring. So HRL is known for our exchange only triple dot qubits. Um, the device that we're studying is this uh, six dot device. This is an accumulation mode silicon SIGI using aluminum overlapping gates and it is fabbed on 800 ppm 29 silicon. Our experiments typically are as follows. We initialize a singlet from a bath. We separate that into the 111 charge state and coherent control is performed using uh, voltage pulses on exchange or barrier gates. And then finally, we do single shot readout using polyspin blockade. And hopefully you guys saw some of the other talks um, that are going to be filmed as well. So how does coherent control in the system work? The nice thing about having three spins is that this allows us to have full block sphere control using only the exchange interaction. So rotations about the z-axis are done by swapping spins one and two. And rotations about this thing we called an n-axis is performed by swapping spins two and three. The unfortunate part is that this leads to very complicated state space. However, for the purposes of this talk and most of the experiments that we perform, we really can simplify everything so that we have an encoded zero, an encoded one, which, perform, which forms our computational basis or the uh, decoherence-free subsystem. And then we have a leak state, Q. And what's important to note is that the Q state and the encoded one both uh, show up as triplets during the measurement. If we initialize the system into the DFS, exchange, and therefore charge noise, only acts within the computational states. However, hyperfine noise can drive transitions between all states and therefore causes leakage. So I called this thing a decoherence-free subsystem. Why is there so still hyperfine dephasing? And this is because each individual electron spin is only interacting with its local nuclear spin environment. So a simple construction of an echo sequence is to simply take the spins and swap them, fully permuting them so that each spin interacts with each nuclear spin bath for the same amount of time. This has the effect of homogenizing the magnetic field, rendering the qubit insensitive to gradient noise to first order. This can be accomplished very simply, like I said before. Swaps between spins two and three is simply a pi rotation around the n-axis. Swaps between spins one and two is simply a pi rotation around the z-axis. And as you can see, it takes six interleaved n pi z pi rotations to form this decoupling block. The nice thing about this is that this also has the effect of symmetrizing the exchange and cancels out any miscalibration or over-rotation error to first order. 
A detail that I won't get into uh, is that due to finite pulse effects, gradients which occur while the pulses are on show up as rotations around the y-axis. And to mitigate against this effect, what we'll do is we'll initialize along y by doing first performing a rotation from y to z before we do the decoupling. And then at the end of the experiment, we rotate back from y to z um, to do readout. In a typical echo experiment, you might sweep the separation between pulse to pulse. And uh, that data can then be inverted, um, such as these groups have done, to extract high frequency noise spectra. And in this case, these are magnetic noise spectra from that data. Um, our experiment's going to be a little bit different. Instead of sweeping the pulse to pulse separation, we're going to take this decoupling block and simply repeat it multiple times. To understand how this works, let's take a filter function formalism, where the error after such a sequence is equal to the integral of this, the filter function of that sequence with the power spectral density of the noise source. And on the bottom here, I'm plotting the filter function of such a sequence after 1, 10, and 100 repetitions of that decoupling block. The first thing to notice is that this filter function is very insensitive. It drops off very quickly uh, for low frequency noise. Additionally, the passbands of this filter function, the locations in frequency space of, those, of those, these passbands are independent of the number of repetitions. They're simply determined by the pulse to pulse timing inside of a single decoupling block. For a pulse duration and idle time of 10 nanoseconds, um, the location of this first passband is at 8 megahertz, which is very high frequency. So now that I've described how this experiment works, let's go back and take a look at the data again. So this is the same data that I presented at the beginning of the talk. However, I'm plotting it slightly differently. Instead of the total number of exchange pulses, I'm plotting it versus the number of NZ pairs. And you'll see that in addition to the singlet return probability, I'm also plotting on the bottom a measured triplet return probability. And that's because we can use these two data sets to quantify both the error in the encoded space by taking the difference between the two and the leakage out of the encoded space by taking the sum. And that's because, as we said at the beginning, leak states show up as triplets in measurement. We also said that magnetic noise causes leakage, whereas charge noise does not. And as you'll notice here, we've measured no leakage, even though at 20, uh, Sorry, even though at 200,000 uh, exchange pulses and the system has fully decohered, there's still no leakage. So that implies that there's negligible magnetic error contribution to this de decoherence. So if magnetic noise is not the dominant source of error, what is? And do we understand all of our error sources? To help us answer this question, we turn to simulation. Excuse me. In our simulation, we have an exchange simulator. And we're going to include only two noise sources. Um, we're going to include hyperfine noise, which is 1 over f, and charge noise, which is also 1 over f. And we calibrate these to produce a T2 star of 2 microseconds and 25 uh, time Rabi oscillations. Um, these are uh, measured numbers from the experiment as well. Additionally, we include a small 30 microtesla uh, magnetic field. And this is basically the magnitude of Earth's field uh, in Malibu. And instead of simulating a simple uh, single experiment, we'll, we're going to perform a suite of experiments. And here I'm plotting the measured sequence error rate and leakage rate um, as a function of the pulse to pulse spacing, the idle time. When we plot the simulation on top of the measurements, we can see that despite only including two error sources, we are able to accurately predict the uh, measured error rates. And even in the simulation, you can see that there is negligible contribution um, from magnetic error to the uh, decoherence of this sequence uh, for um, very short idle times. So that tells us that these uh, error rates are basically dominated by the tail of the 1 over f charge noise. You might also notice that there's this feature here. And this is basically due to the Larmor precession of the electron spins in Earth's magnetic field. 
So in conclusion, uh, we've demonstrated this uh, full permutation or NZ decoupling sequence, which echoes out magnetic noise. Um, it's first, or first order insensitive to miscalibration error, and it suppresses all low frequency errors. We can maintain spin coherence for more than 17,000 exchange pulses using this sequence. And because it has such a high fidelity, we can use it to um, characterize uh, our known error sources in combination with our simulation tools, and therefore look for unknown sources of error. For this device, at an error rate of 5e e minus 5, um, we have seen that the 1 over f charge noise and 1 over f magnetic noise seems to account for all of the error that we measure. Thank you.